I'm delighted to be here. Um, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Envision, for inviting me. So, yes, code and art stuff. So, primarily, I describe myself as an artist, I guess, but I make stuff with code, right? But you could say that I'm a programmer who makes arty stuff. <laughs> Sorry, is that too deep early on in the evening? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, let's just go straight to the fun stuff. Okay, so <laughs> I thought uh, in order to um, uh, demonstrate what we could do with code, I'd use a Commodore 64. In fact, let's not do that. Let's do it live. Yeah, let's do it like with on an actual Commodore, a real actual Commodore 64 emulator. Are you ready? Just silence. <laughs> it's okay, you can say stuff, it's totally fine. Don't just ask questions or whatever. Look, we're all friendly. It's just a small little crowd of friends, right? Don't just shout out, it's fine. It's fine. Dead silence. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. <laughs> right, let's do some one handed coding. <laughs> right. And obviously I am doing very advanced programming here, right? But I'm very experienced and professional. So it's not too big of a problem. Uh, actually, how do you spell it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do the imlaut, sorry. Oh, that's pretty, yeah? See where I'm going with this? Just what? Just, oh, no. Right, <laughs> you can tell the sort of evening I'm going to have tonight, right? Even programming on a Commodore 64, I'm getting optimization tips <laughs> from the audience. Okay, that's fine. That's what I would expect. Are you ready for this? All right. I can tell you're excited. Okay, now this is where I have to do that because I don't have a run-stop key on my laptop. Okay. It's... Uh, it's quite good. Did you, did you have a Commodore 64 when you were young? No? Yeah, some of you did. Okay. I, I mean, this is the sort of computer that I learned to program. I, I programmed on a BBC Micro when I was very young, but it's very similar. Have you seen this magic trick? If I do that? Notice how I'm editing the code here. <laughs> I'm just using the cursors. I can just change stuff. It's amazing. Okay, so now... Oh, right. <laughs> okay, no, it will get better. Okay, I'm just building up to it. Okay, right, let's have another look. Um, yes, so in, on the Commodore 64, there were actual special characters. I don't know if you played with those. You can do CHR dollar and then put a number in brackets, uh, like the character number that you want, uh, and then... So you can get these special graphics characters. So if I run that, you'll see it's, it's, it looks like a, a forward sl a backslash, but it's actually a special graphics character. You'll notice it goes all the way across the character. And then we can add some randomness. Uh, uh, uh. One-handed typing. That's pretty good, right? 205.5 plus random, a random number between zero and one. And it will round down, of course. And then... Uh, right, so <laughs> this is what we would call these days uh, generative art. <laughs> but back in 1983, was it? Does anyone know when? Yeah, something like that. Back in 1983, this wasn't really generative art. It was just an example that was in the manual for the computer, right? So back then, people bought computers just to learn to program, which is pretty fun. Uh, in fact, there's a celebration of this very early example of, of generative art. Uh, and it's uh, that someone actually wrote a book about it. <laughs> As, have you heard about the book that's about this bit of code? No, do you know what it's called? Can you guess? It's called 10 print CHR dollar 205.5 plus R and D one <laughs> brackets semicolon colon go to 10. So they've actually even compressed it into a single line of code there, <laughs> right? Which is 
pretty advanced stuff. This is a really, really good book, um, exploring the early days of code, and it actually also gets um, a lot of modern digital artists to produce work based on this very simple example. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about... Hang on a sec. I'm just going to turn mirroring off. Uh, oh, there you go. That's what I want, isn't it? It used to be a, a single key to do that, but anyway, that's my problem. Right, uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk you through a few of my projects, uh, just to sort of give you an idea of the sort of creative coding that I like to do. So this is a, a newish project called the Mindfulness Machine. Uh, it's currently at the Science Gallery in Dublin. They have uh, a, an, a, an exhibition called Humans Need Not Apply, and it's all about artificial intelligence and the future of, of robots and stuff. So I thought that I would make a, a robot that likes to colour in, uh, you know, because obviously we're very busy these days. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's exploring the idea that in the future when intelligence is that are computer-based become very sophisticated, they're going to be stressed, right? Just like we are. So they're going to need to chill out just as, just as much as we do. So um, it has a camera and all kinds of sensors. So this, this robot gets moody, right? So it's, <laughs> its mood is dependent on lots of things, like the temperature or the amount of daylight or how many people are looking at it. So you could see just before there was a picture, there was a camera. So it's looking to see uh, who's around it. And there's a little Arduino in there with uh, temperature sensors and all sorts. So let's just have a look. What have I got? Right, so here's, here's the actual screen. So there's this plotter and this computer screen. And so you can see here lots of the data uh, that's coming into the, the robot. So there you can see its camera view. You can see it's tracking the motion. So if there's lots of motion around it, it gets a bit more stimulated. And you can see all the other settings in the middle at the top there. Sorry, I know some of you are looking at on screens. Uh, I'm talking about the bit in the top in the middle. So you've got the temperature and the brightness and the color temperature. And that's its mood over time. And you can see the algorithms that it's using for coloring in. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite fun. Um, so I'm using for this a, an old plotter from the 80s. It's a, an old uh, pen plotter. I love the, these old uh, technology. And plotters are great, right? Because it literally just moves a pen around. And back then, it was the only way to get really high quality, fine lines, right? Because back then, we had rubbishy dot matrix printers that were very poor quality, uh, very big pixels. But now our pixels are so small, we don't need pen plotters anymore. But they are really fun. Um, obviously, it's quite difficult to get pens to fit them. And I had to provide the science gallery is four months worth of pens, <laughs> but that's okay. I found uh, these felt tip pens, uh, they're just made by Bic, and you can get a classroom pack with about 250 in <laughs> for about 20 pounds. So that's really good. I just had to adapt them to fit in the pen plotter, so I made this adapter, and just because I'm a dork, I put my logo on it as well. It's so small. Um, so yeah, here's some footage, a bit of time-lapse footage of it running. There you go, oh, it came eventually, yeah. So that's it, that's it running in the gallery. You can see where it's, it's colouring in quite dark colours in this case, so it's a bit grumpy. I think it was a Wednesday. It doesn't like Wednesdays. Who does like Wednesdays? And there you can see all the sensors and the camera and a little readout. The little lights on the camera change depending on its mood as well. So pleasing. so much better at colouring in than we are, right? <laughs> Robots are going to take over all the jobs. It's quite interesting though, because although it's meant to be the robot relaxing and enjoying some mindfulness, it is somehow really mindful to just sort of watch it. And, and I heard from the gallery that some people, it takes about three hours <laughs> right, to finish colouring in one sheet. And some people visiting the gallery have just stayed there for the full three hours just staring at it. Anyway, so that's uh, Mindfulness Machine. It's uh, in Dublin for the rest of the week. And then I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I should bring it here. Yeah, should I bring it over? Yeah. OK, cool. I think it would fit in in this sort of general area. It's a really nice building, isn't it? I like it. 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about another project which is of a similar vein. This was a few years ago, but Mindfulness Machine is sort of a, a, a predecessor of, of Lunar Trails. Um, Lunar Trails is based all around this game, an arcade game from 1979 called Lunar Lander. Does anyone know it? Yeah, yeah right. So it's 1979. That was arcade games had only been around for a, a few years. I guess the early arcade games were early 70s. Um, but this was 1979, the year after Space Invaders, um, but just before Asteroids. But this is a great game. I love it. It's really, really hard. It's brutally hard. So if you've ever played it, well, in fact, do you want to play it now? You could play, you could play the game now if you want, because I made the perfect recreation of it in JavaScript. So if you go to moonlander.seb.ly, it will work on your phone. Although probably even harder on your phone. I'm just going to give you a chance to open your phone. <laughs> uh, in fact, let's... Right, here it is. So here's the game in JavaScript. So the idea is, is that you have to land the lunar lander on the, on the surface of the moon. It's really, really hard. I can hear people trying now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really simple, this game, but very, very difficult. You've got to land so perfectly flat and smoothly. I'm just going to stop talking for a moment. It's been a while since I've played this. There you go. All right, OK. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> OK, so I made this in JavaScript. And at the time, I was interested in exploring how, we, how I could make this a multiplayer game, right? So I thought, well, how do I make it multiplayer? So the first step of that was that I would um, have it broadcast its location to my server. So right now, this is everyone on the internet playing my game in real time. Um, so uh, that can't all be you, can it? Is that, this, it actually is one of the top results in a Google search for Lunar Lander. So it does generally have a, a handful of people playing it around the world. So this was my first step into, think, into wondering if I could um, make a multiplayer version of this game. You're not listening at all, are you? <laughs> That's fine. Should I just, I'll just let you play for a few minutes? No. <laughs> OK, so um, as part of my tests, I just thought, well, what if I just make it leave a little dot whenever I get a position? So then I can check out what sort of data I'm getting through, how regularly it's being sent to my server, um, and just sort of make sure there's no little glitches. But actually, I left it running, and uh, it looks quite nice, doesn't it? Over time, it sort of builds up into these beautiful trails. So I left it running overnight one time, and, uh, and this is what I got. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Mum. Uh, so, yeah, so I sort of accidentally made some art, right? So, so I never did end up making a multiplayer version of Lunar Lander. I just ended up making an art project instead. So I thought, for a while, it was going around my head, well, wouldn't this be cool if I could somehow scale this up from a little internet thing? into like an installation that I can put in a gallery. So this was actually the first time I went to uh, the Dublin Science Gallery, and they, they basically commissioned me to make a big version. So I thought, first step, get an arcade cabinet, <laughs> right? Because uh, I wanted to recreate the Lunar Lander uh, arcade cabinet. Hang on. Hang on. So yeah, you sort of think, well, how do you get a, um, an arcade cabinet? <laughs> yeah, you can just buy them flat pack. <laughs> That's pretty easy, isn't it? So we built the arcade cabinet, and I had to make a custom control panel because Lunar Lander has uh, it has like a thrust control and like left and right buttons. So I had to somehow recreate that. So I found this uh, arcade button. So um, yeah, I made this control panel, and uh, you know, up to that point, I'd just done programming, right? I hadn't really done much hardware, so it's pretty fun to get into a bit of metal work, <laughs> you know. It was, I don't know, that was exciting to me. Um, 
so yeah, I recreated all the all the graphics. So and that inside the uh, the arcade cabinet is is just actually a full screen browser. So I didn't even um, rewrite it in anything at all. It's just Chrome. So you can see the installation there. Right. So the second part of this installation is a massive plotter that is three meters wide that hangs on the wall. So. Uh, I'd got hold of an open source hanging plotter called the Polygraph, but it was really small and it just wouldn't scale up properly. So I had to investigate how to make this a much bigger, bigger plotter. So I enlisted the help of a mechanical engineer friend of mine who we've subsequently worked with many times, and he persuaded me to get some servo motors. Not the rubbishy little servo motors that you get, but these are like industrial servos, and they're so smooth and perfect. Like, have you ever used um, a laser cutter or a 3D printer? Yeah, have you, anyone? You know how noisy they are? Yeah, that's because they use stepper motors. Now, if they'd used servos like this, they'd be silent and amazing and perfect. I love servo motors. If you want to talk about servo motors later, <laughs> um, I, I'm all ears. Right, OK, so servo motors. I had to make my own drivers for them. Oh, I haven't looked at these for a while. And so here you can see some, that's the, the final uh, hanging plotter there. I think I've got some video there. You can, you can see it there, right? So we've got this hanging pen which hangs off a couple of wires. Uh, there should be a long, oh, there's a, nice, there's a nice video here. That's probably easier if I show you that. Yeah, so you can see there the, the pen plotter hanging. So at the top of the two corners of the page, there are some, some motors up there winding the wire up and down. And doing that, you can move that literally anywhere you want. So the idea is, is that while people play the game there in the gallery, that the plotter traces the path that you take in the game on the wall in real life. So basically what I just showed you on the internet, <laughs> but way bigger and uh, yeah. It was, yeah, it was a fun project. It's like Arduinos in the pen controller, the plotter controller, and I'm communicating it to it through a processing app, uh, which is being communicated with out of the browser through web sockets. Um, yeah, it was pretty fun. And after it left the science gallery, it subsequently went to Beaux-Arts in Brussels and the Art Rock Festival in France. It's been around a few places since then. Oh, let go! <laughs> when I, while I was filming it, like there was a little kid just grabbed it. <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, it's so scary. Because it's quite powerful, these motors are very powerful. Anyway, that's the Lunar Lander. So, let's talk, oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. Right, so I'm going to talk now about uh, Pixel Pyros, which is another one of my projects. It's a virtual digital fireworks display. So I've got this massive screen. It's 20 meters wide and 12 meters high using really big projectors uh, and a laser, which I'll come to later. You can see there the, the rigging for it. We actually use these scissor lifts, you know, that are used for builders, building. Um, and these ones, I think, are uh, just from memory. I think they're six and a half tons each, uh, and, the, but, and so we use four of them. And it's actually quite a good way to rig a screen because otherwise you'd need lots and lots of scaffolding. Uh, yeah, so we rig that there. So if, obviously, with digital fireworks, they can be interactive, right? Because real fireworks, you can, you can't just give <laughs> you can't just give the public like matches. <laughs> and go, there you go, light the fireworks. But with digital fireworks, you can do that. So I have these light sensors all the way along the bottom of the screen. You can see them there. Uh, and using infrared cameras, I can detect motion at the point of that sensor, and I can make fireworks happen. So every single firework is triggered by a member of the public. And also, I've got a laser, <laughs> a really massive laser, that picks out the bright spots in the fireworks. So here's... Here's a little video I can show you of that. So this was one of the first events that we did in the UK uh, back in 2013, but it's been going a few years now. So there's the big projectors. There's two of those that we use. And yeah, the screen just goes up in a, in a couple of minutes. Lots and lots of calibration, obviously, to line up the projectors and line up the laser with the projector, and then line up all the cameras with that output as well. It's 
some very excited people there. So, <laughs> so yeah, there are, um, the show is about 30 minutes long, and there are several different scenes lot, with lots of different styles of fireworks. Like this one is my favorite because it looks a bit like Tron. It's like neon colored fireworks that are vector style fireworks that are kind of impossible to create with real fireworks, right? And then there's this scene, which is actually low resolution 8-bit style, like Commodore 64 fireworks, I suppose. And then, of course, with most of my projects, I find it's a lot better if you add a game. <laughs> so I made Space Invaders and Asteroids with about 30 people all playing. I don't know if you can see the bright spots. So the bullets are actually rendered with the laser. They're a bit flickery in this video. They're not so flickery in real life. But they just make it look really, really bright and beautiful. And this was, I think, one of the first times we added a laser to this show. So now, in subsequent versions of Pixel Park, you can see the sparkles there. If you look out for the sparkles, that's the laser, just really bright spots of light. Um, but now when I run the show, there's just lasers everywhere. I've just added so many lasers to this project. It's ridiculous. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let's move on. Oh yeah, so Pixel Pyros has just come back from the Middle East. It was in Abu Dhabi for a festival there. Um, and I didn't go with it, so it's quite exciting because I'm getting to the stage now where I can get other people, like I've got a whole crew of people that I can trust to take my projects around the world, which is really exciting. Um, and so I knew they were here in Abu Dhabi on the beach. And my friend who happens to run a webcam service uh, for sort of like famous buildings all around the world. He says, I'm sure I've got a hotel installation in Abu Dhabi. So he sent me the link to a high resolution camera image that he was updating. And I actually saw my crew, they're down there on the, on the beach, that's the screen. They've actually rigged it on scaffolding there. Um, and they found out that I could see them as well. So they sent me a message. Can you see what it says on the screen? Just zoom in a bit. Well, it actually says, hi, Seb. <laughs> They wrote it with a laser. That's sweet, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's talk about how it actually works. So I mentioned infrared cameras. So I'm actually just using one infrared camera. And this is what it sees. So you can see those strip lights there. They look like, you know, they look like um, fluorescent strips or something, but they're completely invisible to the human eye. They're in infrared. They can only be seen by my camera. So with with this image, you see that the camera doesn't see anything that I'm projecting with the projectors or the lasers. It just sees the infrared lights and the shadows of people in front of it. So it's a really good, clear image. You can see here, this is what the infrared LEDs look like to us. <laughs> and this is what they look like to the camera, right? So they're really, really bright. It's so weird, because we just can't see them at all. Um, but you can see here in this video, so you can see what my camera can see there, uh, and I'm, I'm testing those pixels there. You can see it or triggering the, the bullets in this case there. Space Invaders. So yeah, so that's P Pixel Pyros. So I love doing big outdoor events, and a couple of years ago I made a new, uh, a similar style of event to Pixel Pyros called Laser Light Synths, which is essentially uh, a musical project where the members, ordinary members of the public get to be in a band, right? So here, who here is in a band? <laughs> OK, who here has ever wanted to be in a band? <laughs> yeah, right, because everyone wants to be in a band. Why did you not end up being in a band, anyone? Can't play an instrument? No musical talent whatsoever? A virtual girl band. Oh. <laughs> Let's just move on quickly. <laughs> that sounds a bit too like weird science for my liking. Um, yeah, so I thought, wouldn't it be fun? Because I was in a band when I was in my 20s. And being in a band is really, really cool. But it is hard. Playing a musical instrument is really difficult. Has anyone tried to learn a musical instrument? It's really hard, isn't it? What, I, I think I can sum up why learning a musical instrument is hard. Um, well, there's a lot of notes. I think that's the first problem. Um, but that would be OK in, of a, in and of itself. But unfortunately, most of the notes are wrong. 
So I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could make a musical instrument that's so easy to play that anyone could play it? You wouldn't have to be a musician. Uh, so I, yeah, I, that's what I set about doing. So I made these synthesizers, these light synths, with, uh, which are touch sensitive. They're covered in super bright LEDs. Here's me building it there. We're using these addressable uh, LED strips. So, so bright. You know, I just spent a whole month with retinal burn. It was, <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. Um, and here you can see with uh, nice uh, metal frames and laser cut acrylic surfaces. I don't know if you can see, but there's some copper tracks on there. And that's what picks up the touch uh, when you touch them. So the thing that I've done in order to make them sound good is uh, so for, yeah, I, I, I was sort of joking about the wrong notes, but that is essentially what I've done. I've taken out, I've set, I've locked all of the notes into a minor pentatonic scale, which is what wind chimes are, are usually set to. You know, wind chimes they always sound nice, they always sound harmonious. It's because there's a, they're all set to a, a minor pentatonic scale or a pentatonic scale of some description. So if you'll see ever like a blues guitarist uh, doing like solos. Often they're just going up and down a pentatonic scale, right? That's the, that's the big secret of being a musician. You just got to learn that. But with my light synths, you don't have to learn it because I, it's only a pentatonic scale, right? So there are literally no wrong notes. Let's just run this video if it's going to, if it's going to work. Let's see, there you go, right? So the synths are at the bottom of each of these columns, locked into time as well as uh, the pentatonic scale. Uh, each one is a different instrument, so there's one that's like a bass sound and one that's uh, like an organ sound and one that's like a twinkly piano sound and one that's like a string sound. And obviously as I'm building this project, because uh, it's still alive, it's still going out, and every time I take it out I change some of the sounds. And then of course you might notice in the background that while you're playing the instruments I'm projecting with a big laser <laughs> onto the building behind it uh, particles that respond to the music that you play. So yeah, it's a, a pretty fun event. Should I bring that over here as well? I'll just bring it all. I'll just come back with a laser. <laughs> Right, let's move on, because you might have noticed that I've talked a lot about lasers. Um, <laughs> I love lasers. Lasers are so much fun. But how do you work with lasers? Um, well, how do they even work? That's, well, obviously, I've got a laser here in my pointer. Uh, this is probably half a milliwatt. The lasers I tend to work with are in the region, well, they're usually above 10 watts. Yeah, so 20,000 times brighter than this, uh, and they're actually the lasers that I use, uh, although there's just a single laser beam, there's three lasers that are converging to make that one beam. So there's a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser. So I can make the laser any color that I like. And because I'm moving the laser around really fast, I can draw shapes with it. So everything you've seen tonight, all the sparkles, all the visualizations from the light synths, that's just been one laser beam moving really fast and drawing all those shapes. How does that work? Well, uh, the laser has a system of mirrors inside it. <laughs> it's, uh, and the mirrors attach to galvanometers. So galvanometers are what you would find in, you know, audio meters with the little needles that go up and down. They're usually attached to a galvanometer. They're like a little electric coil, magnetic, electromagnetic coil that can be energi energized and moved. Uh, and attached to those galv galvos are a mirror. So you can see the beam goes into this one, and that oscillates that way, making the beam go up uh, left and right. <laughs> and then it bounces off this second mirror, which makes it go up and down. And using these two mirrors, you can move the laser to wherever you want. So that's pretty fun, isn't it? It's been quite a long journey for me to figure out how to communicate with professional uh, s display lasers. So there's been a few sort of interface things that I've needed to learn. Um, but I've got it down now and I've actually got a library uh, for open frameworks. Does anyone use open frameworks? It's a C++ creative coding platform. It's pretty fast and fun. But I've built an add-on for uh, open frameworks just to control these lasers. So yeah, I, initially I was just trying to figure out if I could 
use make little particles with the laser. So this was the first test that I did. So this is just one laser that's turning off as it's moving between each point and then turning on for a little moment of time and then turning off and zipping to the next one. So you can imagine programming that sort of system is quite uh, complex. You can see here I'm leaving the laser on in between so you can see the movement that it's going. But I was really pleased that I could get all of those particles. It was pretty fun. And this historic moment was when I first um, tried out the 11-watt laser <laughs> at my laser supplier's uh, offices. Oh, it was good times. So <laughs> you just can't really get a sense of it on this video, but it's literally blinding points of light just lighting up the entire room. If you listen carefully to the soundtrack, you can just hear me going, oh my God. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. So lasers, yeah, so um, everything I do now has lasers, including a Nintendo Zapper, which I'll come to in a moment. Before I talk about that, let's just talk about the Nintendo Entertainment System. Who had one of these? Nintendo and NES, when was it? It was 86, I think, in America. Probably came to Europe, 87, 88, something like that. Anyone have one? Yeah, so it came with, um, so you can see this, uh, this little happy family there. Playing, playing with their Nintendo. The first time I found this picture on the internet was connected to this article, one of those really pedantic articles. Everything that's wrong with this picture, okay, fine. And they're like, oh, he's, look, he hasn't even got the jump press button pressed, and look, he's in midair, so, well, that's totally wrong. <sighs> Pedants, eh? Well, I'm just glad they didn't see this box art from the Asian version of the Nintendo because look, they don't even know how to hold the thing. Look at that. <laughs> so, uh, that look, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> we will worship the precious controller. <laughs> okay, yeah, so here's an advert. So the, the Nintendo Entertainment System came with uh, all these terrible accessories. <laughs> like the worst accessory was this robot. I mean, it looks cool, doesn't it? It looks like you'd think, oh, I, I want that robot. This robot is probably responsible for the most disappointment on Christmas Day of kids of that age uh, possible. I mean, it's such a disappointing robot. It's absolutely rubbish. Look into it if you're interested. I'm not going to talk about it today because I'm going to talk about the NES Zapper. Yeah, light gun. Yeah, so this was very well known uh, at the time. It came bundled with one of the NES packages. Let's just look at it, look at some information about it. This zapper gun lets you shoot moving targets with pinpoint accuracy from up to 16 feet. It's pretty clever. The cable's only eight foot long. <laughs> um, mind you, this cable has only like one foot, so it doesn't even have, uh, that's not even going to get, you're not even going to be able to point that round at your telly, are you? Anyway, so the Zapper, um, yeah, came in a bundle with Duck Hunt and Mario Brothers. Duck Hunt, of course, this, uh, this fun duck shooting game. Uh, I mean, there wasn't much to it, really. It was just this dog who chased the ducks out of the, the grass, and you'd have to shoot them. <laughs> and it was, but it was... Su sorry, what was that? <laughs> no, you can, you can interrupt. It's fine. No, I'm totally cool with it. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, a, actually a very simple game, but really, really fun. Yeah, who's played it? Yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, were you ever curious about how it worked? He knows how it works. So that's what I'm going to tell. I'm just going to assume that everyone wants to know how it works. Or I could just skip this whole section. All right, well, let's, let's come to that a bit later. But it was a very popular game. So lots of people have fond memories. They keep their photos of when they played it as a kid. I don't know. These are just pictures I found off the internet. Some people love the game so much, they dress up their kids as the characters. Um, or even dress up themselves as the characters. Oh, this one's just genuinely worrying. You know you've got a problem if even your dog looks like you don't want to be there, right? Look at, the, look at him. He's embarrassed. It's like, you know, dogs don't mind anything. But no, that's too much for that dog. He's like, oh, sorry. Sorry about my own. It's just embarrassing. Um, some people love duck hunt so much they get inked. And they're, oh, that looks, 
That looks painful. Anyway, back to the guns. So I bought a couple of the guns um, off the internet. Thought I'd open them up, have a look. Here's the inside of one. So you sort of think with a light gun, the suggestion is that it fires light, right? But it actually doesn't fire light. This guy knows. Uh, <laughs> it actually is just a receiver for light. The light goes through this lens here and through this, uh, it's like tube-shaped piece of metal that is only there to make it feel good. It's like a weight, right? There's another weight there just to balance the gun out, just to make it feel good. That's the attention to detail in this gun. So the, oh, damn it, I can push the wrong button. The light goes through that hole and into a sensor here uh, when you push the button, when you fire the gun. Um, but what's it looking at? Well, let's just have a look at the game. You can see the duck is, uh, is flying up. You're aiming your gun at it, you're firing at it, and there you go. Well, let's, let's just slow down, let's just pause uh, on my VHS system <laughs> and rewind a little bit uh, so, and slow it down. Let's run it in slow-mo. So the duck's flying, and then you pull the trigger, and that sends the NES console a message, and the NES console goes blank for one frame. And then after a frame, it actually lights up the area of the screen that the duck was at. So if your gun sees a black frame and then a white frame, it knows that it was pointing at the duck. And it, that's pretty clever, isn't it? It's amazing. So that should work, right, even now with modern TVs. But no, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It's really sad. The reason it doesn't work is because most modern TVs, even some cathode ray tube TVs, the, the more recent ones before they stopped making them, um, they've got some digital processing in. So there's a tiny delay before what is sent to the TV appears on the TV, and it's just too long to, m to make the guns work anymore. Oh, sad, isn't it? It's pretty sad. Um, but on the plus side, it means they're really cheap on the internet. So, I <laughs> so yeah, I bought loads of them, and I thought, well, these, these guns are fun, but wouldn't it be more fun if there was a laser inside? So I pulled it apart, there it is, and you know, I put a laser in pretty quickly. Putting a laser into the gun is very, very simple. You can see I've got a teensy Arduino type thing there and a laser there. So just sort of me testing it out to see how it fit. Yeah, and it was fine, it was easy. And then I got a better laser as well, a slightly more powerful one, and I stuck it in, stuck it in the end. Um, so I thought, well, let's see what that looks like. And then I put some super bright LEDs down the side, and here's a little test. So. <laughs> So I made the LEDs kind of flash in a line, and then it fired the laser, so it sort of looks like it's, like it's moving through the air, right? It's pretty fun. Um, but the thing about lasers, I mean, obviously that's cool, and this laser is cool, right? All lasers are cool, but sometimes you just want to see laser beams, right? You just want to see big laser beams going through the air. Look, there's no laser beam coming out of there. You just see the end. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be better if I, could, uh, if I could make a laser beam, a visible laser beam, come out of the gun? So I thought, well, the, well, the, the way that you do that, I don't know if you know this, but if you are into lasers, the only way you can see laser beams is if there's some sort of smoke in the air. If there's a smoke machine or a, a fog machine in the room, then you'll see the laser beams. So I thought, well, let's just see what it looks like with a bit of smoke. So I got my smoke machine, and I pointed my new laser in it. Oh, so... That's better, isn't it? Look at that. Laser beams. But it was like, I can't just carry a smoke machine around wherever I go, wherever I want to fire the gun. So I thought, um, wouldn't it be better if I could put a smoke machine inside the gun? <laughs> so I went to the local vape store. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized that you just need to get an air compressor and blast air through an e-cigarette, and it pumps out smoke. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting trip to the vape store. Those places are weird. I don't know what they're like here, but in England, they are weird. Weird places. Mind you, it was probably my fault. Um, they said, well, what sort of e-cigarette do you want? I was like, I don't know, a small one? And they're like, well, yeah, but I mean, what, what do you want it for? And I was like, well, I want to put it in my laser gun. <laughs> so it didn't really go that well. But then I realized later 
um, that I could get really small e-cigarettes, like these tiny ones. And you know, this I didn't know anything about these. I don't smoke, so this was all a really exciting journey of discovery. And these ones are amazing because the entire smoke machine apparatus is inside that bit of filter there, the yellow bit. And this whole white cigarette bit is actually just the battery. Right, so I was like, oh, I don't need a battery. I can put power into it. So I ended up just using like this tiny bit, and I could squeeze that into the gun. No problem. Um, but then I had to control that. It drew quite a lot of current, so I needed to make a custom circuit board. So I milled one out uh, and put lots of MOSFETs on it. Uh, and again, a little mounting for the teensy. And so then I, I put it all together. I ended up with this. You can just about see the, the, the laser coming out the end of it. That's pr pretty cool. So um, here's the final thing. <laughs> oh, it's such a squeeze. <laughs> yes, thank you. Just, just in case you didn't hear that, someone said I was crazy. Not the first time. OK, so here's my custom PCB and the teensies on that. So the PCB has lots of MOSFETs on it, and it's powering the smoke machine, which draws a lot of current, the air pump that draws quite a lot of current, and the laser as well. So there's lots of MOSFETs on here to amplify the electrical signal from the teensy. This ended up getting a 50 milliwatt laser, which is about, it's not that bright, but it's 50 times brighter than this, so it's not bad. Um, and actually, the, because I'm just flashing it as well, it does. It takes a little while to get to full brightness, so I'm not sure I get the full 50 milliwatts out of it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so the question is, <laughs> why didn't I just get my own case? Why didn't I just build my own gun? Well, because then it wouldn't be a Nintendo Zapper. Like, duh. Uh, <laughs> that is a totally fair question. <laughs> OK, so uh, there's the air pump. And I 3D printed a little duct there, a little tube that pushes in air into this is the e-cigarette there. Uh, and the wires are going into that, into a little Suguru mount for that. Uh, so that pump blows, the smoke comes out of there. There's also a tiny little fan there. You can just about see I've drilled some holes in the bottom of the gun so the air passes through. Uh, and these are 3D printed kind of brackets for the laser. So there's a bit of edge around the laser. So the smoke can go past the laser and the laser points out here. So let's have a look how that looks. There you go. Ah, right. <laughs> now there's a bit of extra magic going on here, but you can just about see uh, when the smoke gets going. You can see the laser beam coming out of the gun, right? That looks pretty cool. So I suspect you're probably wondering, <laughs> how did I do that big explosion effect at the, <laughs> at the wall? No, you are, you're not wondering. OK, fine, I'll skip. I'll move past. No, you are worried. OK. <laughs> OK, well, that is done with my, uh, my own personal 4-watt laser at home. <laughs> so it's obviously a lot brighter than the laser in the gun. So I'm using an infrared camera to see where the laser beam hits the wall. And then I'm projecting with my 4-watt laser in the same position, an explosion. There's a guy here just with his head in his hands. That's, that's fine. Am I going over time? I don't even know. No, no I'm OK. OK, good. Um, right, so, so that's, that's pretty cool. And, and so I, this was just all, all work in progress. Um, and I just posted this video on the internet. And the internet really liked it. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was my Twitter <laughs> account. I mean, look, just flatlined all of my previous achievements on Twitter. <laughs> just like, Pff. the next day, I just was like, Grr, down again. But anyway, let's not focus on that. Um, yeah, so um, Hacker Day featured it, Gizmodo featured it, a few places featured it. Um, and that was all in time for me to test it out at the launch of the Digital Festival in Brighton. So here's my friend James, uh, my other friend Jamie, uh, testing it out for me. Let's have a look. There you go. Right, so you can see him firing it. And I've made a version of Asteroids that is projected with my big laser. So this is James playing Asteroids with my uh, laser gun. Oh, he loves it. Look at that. So the entire Asteroids game and the explosions are all rendered with my big 4-watt laser. Yeah, pretty cool.
Okay, so I thought that's pretty cool, but obviously, like the NES Zapper, everyone knows it for duck hunt, right? So wouldn't it be cool if I could make laser duck hunts? <laughs> yeah, I can tell your minds are going, oh yeah, that'd be cool. So asteroids is actually very easy to render with a laser, right? Because lasers can draw straight lines and stuff like that pretty easily. In fact, it's very close to the original asteroid screen, which was a vector display. And if you're interested, I will tweet a link to a video that I made with my friend Matt Parker, Stand Up Maths on YouTube, uh, talking about how I made asteroids with the laser. So I'll link you to that later. Um, but Duck Hunt isn't really a vector game. It's a pixel game. You can see all the sprites that I downloaded off the internet, and I had to painstakingly draw every single one of those in a way that would be renderable by a laser. So yeah, it took me a little while, but before long I had laser duck hunts, yay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, here's some, here's some pictures of, of it. So you can see I've managed to just about get the, the duck to, uh, to look sort of ducky enough. Is that a word? You've got lots of ducks here, don't you? You could play real duck hunts <laughs> if you're so inclined. Um, yeah, so, oh yes. It's looking good. My laser gun's looking good. All right, so um, that's pretty much. I think any questions about any? I think I've run out of. I think I've run out of talk. <laughs> I haven't really thought about how to end my talk. I just thought I'll end with a laser gun. Um, I would have brought it with me, but I just would. Have, I can really go through hand luggage with a laser gun. <laughs> Right, could I? Not really. Anyway, so yes, this is uh, Laser Duck Hunt. So um, I'm going to end my talk and I really on with Laser Duck Hunt. I hope it's been fun. I'll stick around for questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <clears throat> you can ask them in German as well, if you want. I, I won't understand it, but you can. As well. <laughs> I they, can translate. They do, I, don't, I think I answered all the questions, didn't I? I got a question, actually. Do you? Yeah. Okay. I do. That's cool. You, you said when you were in your 20s, and you still look like you're in your 20s. <sighs> I, I have a real so motherly old. question. Have you done any real stuff before you did this? <laughs> This is real work. <laughs> um, I'm actually quite old. <laughs> um, I'm 46. So, um, actually, no, I'm 45. <laughs> Don't even know how old I'm. Uh, yes, I've had lots of real jobs. Um, most of my 20s, I was in a band, but I set up my own label as well. And before that, I was in a band. Before I was in a band, I was doing uh, development for Amiga. Uh -huh. The Commodore Amiga, yeah. um, CD TV, and Amiga CD. So I was right around when it was all going to shit before Commodore went bust. Throughout my career in a band, obviously, I we had some success, but we didn't really make any money. So I had to start doing web design on the side as a freelance job. And then I ended up doing games, flash games, in the early 2000s. Uh -huh. And I ended up building a company around that. It grew to about 15 people before I realized it wasn't really fun anymore. <laughs> so I left my own company, uh, much to the consternation of my partners, <laughs> my business partners who weren't, sorry, sorry, business partners. But they're incredibly successful still, probably more so without me. <laughs> um, but that was perhaps five or six or seven years ago, something like that. So since then, I've been doing talks and workshops and my art projects, and it's just sort of grown out of that, really. Yeah. It, so, very, very cool. Yeah. Absolutely. I was just heading at, is this something you learned just by yourself, or it, did it appear from what you did before, and it apparently yeah, did? Yeah, I mean, it all kind of, it, it definitely builds on everything I, I know how to do now is built onto something before, right? So particularly the the work programming flash games. Uh -huh. That's That's been really important to the sort of learning how to make things animate and smoothly and, you know, move nicely with code. That's really important skill that I think I learned from programming uh, web games. In, yeah. It's amazing. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Other questions? 
Yeah, it's one at the front. Now you're the one who knew how Duck Hunt worked, uh, right? Yeah, apparently because I'm almost the same age. Oh, right, yeah. Um, just one question. How do, you get, how do you get the funding to do these bigger installations? And <gasps> That's a really good stuff? question. So, um, it, they're really expensive. <laughs> Let's just start with that, all right? Um, Pixel Pyros and Laser Light Sense. Pixel Pyros is the most expensive. It's got a big crew, lots of heavy plants, loads of documentation and planning. Can you imagine all the safety element? And the, thankfully, I've got a production manager who specializes in outdoor events. So she does all the evacuation plans and the risk management. And, uh, but yes, it's expensive. How do you find people to pay that money? Well, the first time I did it, I got a small-ish grant from the Arts Council. So the first time I did it in Brighton at the Digital Festival, I got a small grant to do it. Um, the people from the Arts Council were there and they really loved it and they said, look, you should take this on tour. So the next year I applied for a much bigger grant. Um, but that was that's a very lengthy, complicated process as well, right? Because you've got to get match funding, you've got to get dates booked in. So I found festivals around the UK that could contribute some of the money and then I got another load from the Arts Council. So yeah, that was probably the first time I'd been through that. Now that's all up and running, um, you know, I'll just get approached by light festivals and they usually have pretty good budgets, like, um, like I did a brilliant uh, event in Aberdeen called Spectra. Aberdeen is in Scotland, uh, very, very north, very cold. Um, but that's a really cool festival. They've got a decent budget funded by lots of places. Um, yeah, and Abu Dhabi, obviously, Middle East's got lots of money for that sort of thing. But yeah, it's a really good question. It's it's one of those, it's been sort of slowly building over the last, well, since 2012, I guess, when I first did Pixel Pyros. And it's, you know, just getting my name out there, getting people to hear about me. Um, but yeah, nothing, I, th I suppose with all of my projects, um, nothing really happens unless I sort of make it happen. Um, so they're the big, they're the most expensive things. The outdoor events are the most expensive. And then the stuff like the smaller installations, like the mindfulness machine and uh, lunar trails, they're a lot cheaper. And they were both commissioned by the Dublin Science Gallery um, and then subsequently have been other places. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. So when Thank I you. first started doing this about five years ago, I was making most of my money doing conferences and workshops. And so over the last, over that, during that time, it's kind of shifted. So now I'm probably making more money out of the installations than I am this sort of talk. I don't have much time to do these sort of things anymore. So um, yeah, it's sort of been slowly shifting. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, with all your plotter projects, uh, what happens with the finished pieces of art? Oh, that's a really good question, you know, um, because um, I don't know what happened to a lot of the Lunar Trails artwork. I think it might have just got... It didn't all come back with the plotter. I think that project would produce a new artwork every two or three days. So there should have been like 30 or 40 or 50 or something like that. And I think I got like five or six. They're really hard to store because they're massive. And I think they're in my loft getting a bit battered, um, which is really tragic. I don't know what to do with them. If you want one, let me know, mm -hmm. I'll sell you it. Uh, <laughs> but the um, mindfulness machine, that's currently at around 280 pictures. And they're going to send them all back to me. And I don't know what, to, I mean, I want to sell them, but it's so much work to make a shop. And, but yeah, I, maybe I'll just bring them to all my talks and give them away or sell them cheaply or something. I don't know. But it's a really good question. I, I haven't figured it out yet. If you've got any ideas, let me know. Let me know how much you'd be willing to pay for one. <laughs> That's really hard. A few bucks. A, a what? Well, just a few bucks. Yeah. A few bucks. I mean, I don't know, $100. <laughs> A few bucks or a hundred dollars. Well, <laughs> I can't decide. Okay, make me an offer. I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose. Yes. Any more questions? Uh, I'm wondering, did you ever hurt yourself with your lasers? Ah, that's a really good question because <laughs> lasers, lasers are really dangerous, right? So um, I've been trained uh, to... to uh, he's, he's laughing. <laughs> 
Why is that? Why is that funny? I, I don't a, believe you. I'm a fully trained and qualified laserist. <laughs> yeah, that that's an actual word. Um, in the UK, there isn't really any legal licensing stuff, but because I've been trained, I can produce all the risk assessments and safety documents and and basically do it as safely as possible. Now, with lasers, the only danger really is if you point one at someone, <laughs> right? So, so basically, because I'd never point lasers at humans or animals, uh, it's basically pretty safe, yeah? Um, most of my laser safety training, like 90% of it, was teaching you how to safely scan audiences. Like, you know you go to a techno rave or something. Is that still a thing? Uh, <laughs> and the like, lasers are everywhere and coming out in your face and you're like, whoa, lasers. Like, to do that to an audience is, you need real safety stuff. You need to really know what you're doing and take lots of precautions. But with my stuff, I basically, I mask the aperture of the laser so the laser can't go anywhere it's not supposed to. And then there's also things like a, a massive emergency stop button so that if the scanners stop working for any reason, there's a slight danger that if the laser stops moving that it will start burning what it's hitting. So that, there's that, but that's why you have big button to shut everything down. So there's lots of safety things. When I first started using a laser at home, I got a one watt laser and it didn't, I couldn't adjust the brightness at all. So I was just pointing it at the wall. And it was, you know, it was, it was maybe like a few feet away. And I was really nervous because my eyes hurt just looking at the projection. So I was, like, I was really panicking that I'd really hurt my eyes. And I think you can, you know, obviously it's a bit like staring at any bright light, right? You, you'll get retinal burn. But I was really paranoid. But I think it's quite hard to damage your retinas just by looking at a projected image. But still, you've got to be a bit careful. I'm fully trained, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I don't know what the law is in Germany. I suspect you probably need license or something. In America, it's different in every single state, which is annoying. Yes? First of all, thanks for your talk. Oh, you're welcome. Um, is there something like a hello world of lasers? Because you just got me into this laser thing and I just want to try out something? Oh, well, the first thing is you have to buy a laser. <laughs> <laughs> right, the type of laser that you want is uh, a display laser. They've got a standard interface called ILDA, which is I-L-D-A. I think I might have written a couple of blog posts about it a few years ago, so you might be worth having a little trawl through my website. Yeah, my, blog, my blog is pretty dead, but there's a couple of laser posts from a few years ago. Um, so you've just got to find an interface for it, and I use an uh, open s uh, an interface with an open source driver called EtherDream. Um, but yeah, it's quite an investment. Uh, the the code that I've written to control it is all C++ in Open Framework. So if you haven't done C++, then that's a bit of a you know that's a bit of an investment um, in time. And then you you know you've got to buy a, or borrow a laser. I mean, I suppose you can get some cheaper. ILDA lasers that are just green, for example, you could probably get, but it's still going to be 400 pounds, well, something like that. Okay. Um, it's, it, and, and some of the scanners are usually a bit rubbish, right? So you have to spend probably a couple of thousand before it starts getting good. Well, yeah, and the. I didn't thought about it. I just thought, hey, I'm going home, buy a laser on <laughs> eBay. Well, well, it's interesting. 50 bucks or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, there are ways to hack them, um, but I'm not sure I'd really recommend okay. that. And actually, it's really difficult to find resources. So you can sort of make your own Galvos or buy them and, and hack together sound cards and stuff. But even a, you know, a decent sound card is 300 pounds. So you might as well just get a, a laser. But what I've been thinking about doing, now that my laser driver code is a bit more mature, is maybe setting up some workshops. So I could bring a, a big laser or a couple of big lasers, a small group of people, show you how to use it, get started programming it, teach you a bit about open frameworks and C++ as well. Would be really interesting. Okay, well, talk to me after. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do a laser workshop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you said you did quite uh, some, like, you did an open air show in Dubai, in the UK. Is there going to be any... 
one of those here in Germany? Well, probably not. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but if you know anyone with a load of money, then uh, please, please pass my details on, <laughs> on to them. Uh, there is a chance that I might be bringing a laser to this general area, <laughs> in, uh, but probably not outdoors. But follow me on Twitter and, and you'll be the first to know okay. if that happens. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? I want to laser up that big tower over there, yeah. right? Or do you want to laser all over that? No? Yeah, they've done Just it. Just me. No, it is. Every okay, good. <laughs> That's worrying. Any other questions? Let's see. You said that you made this uh, Lunar or something game uh, in JavaScript, right? Yeah. Um, are you doing any other project in JavaScript? Yeah, so JavaScript. I've been friends with JavaScript for, quite, for a long, long time. Right back to when I was doing, you know, I was doing web development in the late 90s and early 2000s. I loved JavaScript then, but I took a break from it to do action script in Flash. And then when I stopped doing action script, like JavaScript could do all of the things that action script could do, and there was Canvas and then WebGL. And so JavaScript, I love JavaScript. I feel very comfortable with it because it's, it's a language I've been using for many, many years. Um, occasionally, I'll do little projects in JavaScript, or there'll be little parts of a project in JavaScript. I'm just trying to think of an example. Uh, there's some. Sometimes I do things with phones. I wonder if I've got some slides of that. Oh yeah, yeah. So I've been working with a choreographer to do some interactive dance performances. <laughs> right. So I've been programming um, JavaScript and Node to communicate with all the phones in the audience. So often I'll do a lot of Node.js WebSocket stuff with uh, communicating with lots of phones, and that's what I'm doing with the choreographer. But this is a, an example of a really old project, I think from 2011. So this was when Wi-Fi was rubbish. Um, I managed to get all the phones in the audience synced up and located. You can see that they're, that's scanning across there. They're meant to be out of sync, they're meant to be scanning. Um, the bit before was when they were all in sync. But this is a really hard bit of this project, is finding where the phones were, so I could make them actually sort of, you know, pulse around and scan around. So this project I might be revisiting a bit soon, so that would be good. That would probably be all JavaScript. Um, also with this project, I added a game, right, where the, back then, do you remember Neon Cat? It was kind of, it's still kind of a thing, but it was really a thing then. <laughs> and Neon Cat would, I programmed this game where Neon Cat ran from phone to phone, and as it ran past your phone, you'd have to tap the screen. And if you caught him, your screen would go rainbow colored. So you can see that, that guy at the back there, he's got a flashing rainbow face. That's because he caught the cat. Look at the guy at the front, he's so happy. He, ca <laughs> he caught the Neon Cat. So, yeah, I, d I do occasionally do JavaScript stuff. Um, I work a lot with Arduino, which is all C++. I work a lot with processing, which is Java, and um, Open Frameworks, which is also C++. Learn all the languages and switch constantly between them. It's brilliant. Not at all confusing. This stuff, what you showed uh, with the smartphones uh, in Java Enterprise Edition? JavaScript. JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, can you just for not deeply nerds, explain <laughs> a little bit how long does this project take to uh, connect uh, the smartphones in one room together? And what is, wh uh, p please, more details. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's very similar technology to the Lunar Lander game that you were all playing earlier. Do you want to play it again? Yeah. yeah, let's do it. Let's do that. So, how am I running it? Okay, so there is. With that sort of real-time communication, you have to, um, oh look, it's still going. <laughs> you have to, um, uh, you, you, well, I'm doing it with a WebSocket connection. Have you heard about WebSockets? In fact, I did a, an article. I wrote something, hang on, 24ways.org. So I wrote an article which was actually um, about, you know, do you remember Stranger Things, <laughs> the the Netflix show? Yeah, did anyone see it? Awesome. Oh, the video can't be played. 
Um, so I made, oh, let me open it in a different browser, sorry. Sorry, everyone, sorry. Hang on, I need to focus, don't I? <laughs> focus, Sev. <laughs> yeah, I just I just haven't in, installed Flash on, <laughs> on that. Who installs Flash? Right, so I made um, a thing where you could talk to people uh, through a web interface and make their lights light up in the room. So that was a very, these are all similar projects, right? Because I've got a WebSocket server running on Node, a Node.js computer somewhere. And then the browser connects through WebSockets to that server. So it's constantly sending messages. You know, with WebSockets, it's a very instant way of communicating backwards and forwards between a server. There's a few things that, particularly with Pixel phones, to do with syncing that I did. So there's a few little tricks there. But on the whole, it's relatively straightforward. And if you want an introduction, this is a good article about getting set up. So yeah, I like doing Node.js on the Raspberry Pi as well. This is all those lights are connected to a Raspberry Pi. So, yes. Any more questions? So when you work with JavaScript, uh, you probably use something like processing JS or p JS, something like that. No, I don't. I just yeah. use JavaScript. Just plain vanilla JavaScript. Hell yeah. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I mean, it's partly just because I mean, there's a few, a, few, a few things that I, like, if I'm using WebSockets, then I'll use Socket.io, is it? Yeah. I can't remember which one I use now, because it's been a little while. Uh, Socket.io has got a, a client-side library as well, which makes it really easy. But for all the canvas drawing and stuff like that, I've got a few helper functions that I've set up. Um, but yeah, mostly it's raw JavaScript, because I don't work in the web full time. I can't even just really keep up with React and all that stuff. I just, I just can't. I don't, I, just don't, I don't want to. Just if I need it, if I need JavaScript, I'll just write some JavaScript. Yes. Okay. Is that it? Done. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>